the majestic eagle, swift, silent, deadly, a symbol of strength. But ounce for ounce, a tiny sparrowhawk has greater power than this mighty hunter of the sky. From Chicago's world-famous Lincoln Park Zoo, here is Marlon Perkins with today's adventure, Hunters of the Sky. Well, that wasn't ex exactly the way I'd planned it. I was going to have him fly directly to my fist instead of onto my head. And now I'd like to welcome you to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Wherever animals are found, you'll also find predators, animals that live by killing others. On the land, cats and wolves are a good example. And in the ocean, sharks and killer whales. In the air above the land and the sea, the birds of prey are the hunters of the sky. This red-tailed hawk is a fine example of a bird of prey. He is instinctively a most efficient hunter. Now, watch this. Well, that was a good example of hunting behavior, Marlon. He went that because it was furry and it moved, and he's convinced it was alive and is going to try to eat it. Notice that he hovers over it with his wings, so I can't see it. And I'm going to have to offer the bird a reward to even get it away from her. Let's see here now. Look at him. Well, she was convinced of that. Uh, she certainly was. Birds of prey are usually divided into four types. The hawks are the smaller of the birds of prey that are designed to catch and kill their own prey. Eagles are also designed to catch and kill their own prey, but they're considerably larger. This is a harpy eagle from South America. Vultures are not designed to kill their own prey, and as a result, feed almost entirely on carrion. This is an immature king vulture, also from South America. The last of the four types of birds of prey are owls. They're especially designed for hunting at nighttime. Compared to our knowledge of most other animals, we really know very little about the birds of prey. And most of this knowledge we've learned by using these birds in the sport of falconry. The most famous of all of the birds of prey is the falcon himself. And Jim, that is certainly a beautiful one. Now well, this is a lanner falcon from the continent of Africa. And falcons are noted for their speed. This is the fastest of all the hawks. They also are very intelligent. They learn a routine very fast in captivity. And falconers control the falcon with a lure like this. And they can be controlled even in a situation as small and confined as this room. So if, uh, if you'll take this lure to the other side, we mm -hmm. can see that. Oh, falcon. That's just an owl sitting over there. Don't be afraid of it. When you're hunting with a falcon, that lure is used to bring the falcon back to you. And he can see it from a great distance, and he gets a reward from it if he comes to it. So I think the falcon's all set. This bird's a hunter and well equipped to perform his role. Those black stripes under his eyes cut down on the glare so that he can see better in bright sunlight. Football players put black stripes under their eyes for the same reason. So that air can be inhaled at high speeds, it's slowed down by these cones in the center of the falcon's nostrils. These are aids that help it survive in its native habitat, which is open mountain country or prairie. Great flyer that it is, the falcon spends most of its day just sitting, digesting its food. 
But when it's hungry, it takes to the air and becomes a hunter that's not afraid to go after an animal three times its own weight, such as a pheasant. First, the falcon gains altitude, then soars about waiting for its prey to move out into the open. With sharp eyes, the falcon waits for the right moment, folds its wings, and begins its stunning attack. Streamlined for speed, it's the fastest bird on Earth, plummeting through the sky at an incredible 180 miles an hour. Yet for all its speed and ability, the falcon sometimes misses and its prey escapes. To know next time not to walk out into the open when a falcon is overhead. Falcons are daytime flyers that rely upon their enormous speed and the element of surprise to capture their prey. Nighttime flyers are specialized in other ways. Owls, for example, fly silently. Let me see if I can demonstrate that. That wing beat doesn't make much noise. Jim, try the falcon. Hey. I think it's pretty obvious that an owl could approach his prey silently on the wing. This is because his flight feathers are covered with sound-absorbing fuzz. I can show this by comparing an owl feather with a falcon feather. Jim, can you take the owl? Put him on the perch then, will you? Sure. Let me open up the owl feather here so that you can see that fuzz that covers the whole upper surface there. Now, when I open up the feather of the falcon, you see that it is hard and shiny by contrast and has no fuzz. Being nocturnal, owls have particularly good vision. Their eyes are together on the front of their head, which gives them binocular vision. Perhaps because of this, looking wise, they have become the symbol of wisdom. To many people, the eagle has become a symbol of power and courage, and as such has been incorporated into the seals of many nations. The largest and most powerful eagle in the whole world is the harpy eagle. Now, this harpy is a forest dweller, and therefore it's designed for pursuit of its prey right through the middle of the thick forest. Its wings are round and cup-like, and they're sort of used as propellers, and that tail is very broad, and it allows the bird to be highly maneuverable. The Indians worshipped this eagle in South America, and they copied directly from the headdress of this eagle in making their own headdresses. There are many misconceptions about eagles. One is that they're bloodthirsty killers and kill just for the pure thrill of killing. Well, this just isn't so. Now, this bird isn't hungry any longer and shouldn't be interested in killing a creature as defenseless as a baby chick. But to demonstrate that, we're gonna need a little more room. Now, if this eagle is a bloodthirsty killer, all he has to do is to jump from the perch to the tabletop and he can grab himself off a tiny little chick. He's perfectly free to do so. He's curious, that's about all. Well, the eagle didn't grab the chick because the eagle is just not hungry. Another misconception about eagles is that their beak is a weapon. 
Actually, that's just a tool to eat with, and she won't even attack with it. The talons are the attacking weapons. They're actually larger than the big teeth of a big cat. Here's a lion skull, and let's just compare them. You see, the talons are actually longer than the big killing tooth of the lion itself. They enter the prey with enormous uh, strength and pressure. We can demonstrate the pressure behind these talons as they grip their prey with this special measuring device designed to compute the pressure per square inch exerted at the point of the eagle's talons. We better use this harpy eagle because she's good and hungry and hooded. And if she feels something furry in her talons, then she'll give a full grip. This is just a plastic bottle filled with water with a simple water pressure gauge attached. Well, that reads 25 pounds per square inch, but she's got her whole foot around it. I've calculated that if that same grip were applied to the tip of the talon, that this would be roughly equivalent to the weight of 10 men my size standing on the head of a nail. I weigh about 220 pounds, so that's about 2,000 pounds weight. That's unbelievable pressure. By contrast, vultures have very weak talons. If I tried to hold an eagle like this, his talons would go clear on through my arm. But I wouldn't want to get my fingers up around the beak of the vulture because they have very strong cutting surfaces and they might just take the end of the finger off. Before he gets any wild ideas, why don't you get back on there? Not being able to kill their own prey, vultures have to feed on carrion. But that doesn't mean they don't like fresh meat. We feed them fresh meat here in the zoo all the time. You might uh, think that the nakedness around his head adds to his ugliness. And I suppose in a sense it does, but it's important for the bird because that's the contact area with the carrion, which is full of bacteria. And it's only the naked areas that then become exposed. The bird then suns itself afterwards. And uh, as you know, sun is a strong killing agent for bacteria. So the bird then has very little chance of becoming infected. They can't take off from the surface of the ground unless there is a strong breeze blowing or unless they have landed on a high spot someplace because of their weight and because their wings are designed for gliding and soaring. Vultures can glide and soar riding the updrafts hour after hour without even once beating their wings. The smallest bird of prey in North America is the kestrel. Jim is holding one. They prey on grasshoppers and mice, and I don't suppose they could carry anything much larger. And that raises a pretty interesting question. How much weight can any bird of prey actually carry? Well, since he's the smallest, he's a good one to experiment with. Let's see how much he can carry. The books say they can carry approximately 23% of their weight. So first, we better weigh him. Well, he's uh, over three ounces, about three and a quarter ounces. All right. Now, the first weight I've fixed up is 50% of his body weight. Yes, that weighs one and a half ounce. So I'll try it with that first. Now, you get over there on the table. I'm going to try something with you. Whoop. Well, my goodness, he he's... did that with no trouble at all. He made it. <laughs> I'd say the books have made an error. Now, this next weight, since he did that so well, this will bring it up to 87% of his body weight. Yes, that weighs one and a half, too. So I'll add that to this. You know, he did that so easily. Let's make him a, uh, have a much longer flight. Let you hold it. All right. Here you go. Well, he just barely made that, but something's wrong with the books. I think this uh, is definitely an error. Well, Jim, that was certainly a surprise to me. Huh. 
Obviously, the previous studies didn't include kestrels. Doesn't look like it. Because this little bird carried somewhere between 50 and, say, 90% of his own body weight. There have been many stories of eagles picking up small children and flying away with them. While banding golden eagles on the Snake River in Idaho recently, Jim decided to test the weightlifting ability of those eagles to see if they could pick up the weight of a small child. How did it turn out, Jim? It turned out to be quite a cliffhanging adventure. Although the golden eagle has become quite rare in most parts of the world, this stretch along the Snake River supports a large population. Here are extensive wilderness areas where they can hunt. And here are sheer thousand foot cliffs where they can build their eyries safe from marauding animals. Crowned as it is with golden shackles around its head, the golden eagle has long been called the king of the birds. In fact, in the days when falconry was the sport of European nobility, only kings could fly a golden eagle. In flight, with its wingspan of seven feet, it appears even more regal and majestic. The big trick in banding eagles is to locate eyries that aren't completely inaccessible. Fortunately, we found one just a hundred feet from the top of the cliff with a young eagle that appeared just the right age to band. Fully feathered, but not quite able to fly. At least I hoped he couldn't fly, because my plan was to drop down and band him right there on the nest. I also hoped to capture an adult eagle and make that test of its ability to carry a heavy weight. With me was my good friend Morley Nelson. Morley is an expert mountaineer, which was a good thing since on these cliffs, I knew I'd need a lot of help. After tying off to some big boulders, we ran our ropes through a metal ring called a carabiner. This supplies the friction to allow us to rappel safely down the cliff. The eagle flying overhead came closer, and we saw that it was an adult. As we went over the edge, I was trying to concentrate on moving as quietly as possible and staying hidden so that the young eagle on the nest would not see us. But I was also thinking about those ropes. Morley said they'd easily hold two tons of straight pull. But on the other hand, I could snap one with a free fall of as little as 12 feet. When I was close enough to get a good look, I saw that the bird was just about old enough to leave the iron. I was all set to swing down and pin him to the cliff when he took off. Then I knew that it was a brancher, old enough to fly, but still relying on his parents for food. So it soon should come back to the nest. Since I couldn't hand capture the bird, I'd have to trap him. We do this by setting a ring of nylon nooses all around the nest. They're all fastened to a single line, which is tied off or weighted down. When the bird returns and steps in any one of these nooses, its feet become snared. After that, it was just a matter of climbing back up the cliff and waiting. But the waiting was far from monotonous. It was a wonderful opportunity to observe these noble birds in flight. Eagles are masters of the art of gliding, and a cliff that deflects the wind and creates a strong updraft serves him as sort of an elevator. I guess it was about two hours when suddenly I saw an eagle heading for the nest. It was not the brancher, but the mother, and she was caught. Now the idea is to grab her legs so she'll be defenseless. Folding in her wings, they are protected so they won't be damaged. Next, wrapping her in a towel holds those wings down. Since she fears only what she sees, the hood acts as sort of a tranquilizer. Thank you. 
Well, that's all there is to it, except for stowing the bird in your pack and climbing back up the cliff. We banded the eagle with an official U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service marker to aid in their studies designed to preserve the golden eagle from extinction. But before releasing this adult specimen, I wanted to make that test to see whether it could or could not carry the weight of a human baby. I brought along a bag which we filled with about eight pounds of sand. The question was, could the eagle take off and fly with such a weight? The answer, well, see for yourself. Somewhere there may have been a super eagle with far greater strength, but certainly our eagle was grounded by this weight of about eight pounds. Once free of the load though, she was soon airborne, riding the air currents high in the sky. And that after all is where an eagle belongs. Marlon, this big female golden eagle weighs about 12 pounds and that means she can't lift as much weight in proportion as the kestrel can lift. Sometimes we think of predators as synonymous with cruelty, but nature doesn't work that way. There's a purpose. In cases where predators have been controlled or eliminated, contrary to what might be supposed, the other animals in that area haven't prospered, but have fallen prey to uncontrolled diseases, which in some cases have completely wiped them out. Oddly enough, the predators actually protect and improve the quality of the animal populations around them. The land predators, the sea predators, and the hunters of the sky are all a necessary part of the wild kingdom.